Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, Prabal, Ambarish, and Tanvir for this excellent conference. And every day I'm learning so much that by the end of this, I'll have enough work to be done for the next five years at least. Uh, I decided to change the title of the talk and also present the things in, you know, from a somewhat broader perspective. So essentially, I'm going to focus on regulation of motor traffic and how this is controlled. Huh? And of course, you know, gene expression in general is noisy. And how this phenomena controlled by various things like signals, sequence, structure, and suppressors. And that not only in decoding, but also a phenomena called recording. Okay, so this is just a slide to convince you that traffic is something that happens not only in macroscopic world, but also in the world inside the cell. So this is a, a sort of a cartoon, but uh, this is something that has been realized in lab, uh, in Joe Howard's lab earlier, that you have cytoskeletal motor proteins which move on microtubule tracks and at, they can give rise to traffic jam which sort of mimics the traffic jam that we are used to in our macroscopic world. Uh, this is something that we had uh, in a, a worked on several years ago when I just began working on molecular motors. So this is uh, my favorite uh, you know, picture to convince you that such things do occur. So what is shown here are these, these green dots. These are you know, just the, showing you the microtubules. But uh, these red dots here that you are seeing, these are a, a special kind of uh, motor proteins, and as the density increases, uh, so this is low density, intermediate density, and high density, and you can see that traffic jam-like situation can occur. So from the physics point of view, uh, what is interesting here? Interesting is that this is not a system in equilibrium. This is not a system which, in principle, can ever go to equilibrium, because you can have non-equilibrium situations, the system initially is not in equilibrium state, but eventually, given enough time, we will go to an equilibrium state. Typical examples are nucleation, spinodal decomposition, etc. But these are not even those. So these are the systems which are intrinsically non-equilibrium. They are something where some units are moving forward. They are self-driven because these motors generate their own forces that are needed for forward movement. And at best, they can reach a non-equilibrium steady state. So that's what we find interesting. And for such systems, there is no underlying Hamiltonian and no equilibrium even exists. So that is why they are interesting from the perspective of statistical physicists. So first I showed you examples where these were cytoskeletal motors. And we have discussed a lot of cytoskeletal motors in this conference so far. But today I'm going to look at the different kinds of motors. And these motors, of course, again, have been discussed, but I'm going to talk and from the perspective of, again, traffic jam-like situation. So this is a real you know, electron micrograph, and this is a cartoon constructed from here. So here, the motors are moving not on cytoskeletal track. Oh, so these are not made of proteins. These are nucleic acid strands. So what is shown here by these blue objects here, these are the RNA polymerase motors. What they are doing, they are moving from left to right on this track which is DNA, and in the process, they are transcribing the DNA. That means they are synthesizing RNA polymerase. So these RNA polymerases are coming out from here, and this is a bacterial system where the RNA polymerase, I mean, the moment the RNA is made, it is ready for translation. So because of that, simultaneously, transcription and translation can proceed. So these green objects that you are seeing here, these are just the cartoons for ribosome, another class of such molecular machines, and they have started uh, translating the mRNA transcript, and they are going from bottom to the top in this figure. So you can see that there's, you know, these objects may not be visible from the back, which are coming out. They are sort of just the cartoons for the proteins. So you can see here that you have a situation where not only large number of RNA polymerases are moving on the same DNA track, giving you the impression of a traffic of those motors, but you also have these ribosomes which are also moving in a congested traffic-like situation. It is these kinds of traffic that I'm going to focus in this talk today. So what is the you know, 
first starting point for such thing. The first starting point for us is that the basic thing is that we are looking at a traffic-like problem of interacting self-driven particles, self-driven, as I said, because these particles, which are sort of representing these motors, they are generating the energy required for their forward movement. And in a way, you can look at it, so this is the way a physicist would look at it, that you have a system which is finite, so it could be a DNA strand or an mRNA transcript, and on this finite strand, so that's why you have open boundaries on the two sides. So it's a system with open boundary conditions. And you imagine as if you have a reservoir of particles at the two ends. So these particles, which depending on the situation, may represent RNA polymerase or ribosome. So they are entering from one end onto this track. And so there is a rate of that entry. Then they move forward at certain rate of hopping forward. And after reaching the last site, they hop out of the system. Now, in a particular context, if it is transcription, that means DNAs are moving, so this will be the rate of initiation of that process, and this will be the rate of termination of the process, whereas this forward hopping that is shown here, that will represent the elongation by every single unit of the corresponding uh, so if it is transcription, this will be the mRNA. If it is translation, it will be the protein. So this is the elongation process that is being captured by this particular one single rig. Now, this is a sort of a very simple, oversimplified uh, model. Let me, in the beginning itself, make the terminology clear. So this is what is known as the central dogma of molecular biology. It simply says that information encoded in protein cannot go back to DNA or RNA. And of course, DNA can be copied onto DNA. So you can have DNA replication. You can have RNA replication, which happens in viruses. So you can have DNA to RNA transfer of information, which is transcription. RNA to DNA, we have heard yesterday, there's a reverse transcription. And RNA to protein, that is translation. So these are the various machines. So DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, etc. So what is the general thing here? The general thing that we have to keep in mind is only the following, that we have a machine which does three things. There is a template, for example, if it is a DNA template, so the template is DNA, and then a machine moves along this track. Suppose the machine is a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is normally called RNA polymerase. So it moves forward, and product is going to be an RNA. So what does it do? It does three things. It is a motor, so it moves along a heteropolymer track. It decodes the genetic message encoded in the sequence of that track, which is its template. And it polymerizes a heteropolymer using this track as its own template. So these three things are done by these motors. Now this can give rise to various kinds of molecular traffic jams on DNA. This cartoon shows here that so many things are moving on the DNA, and at the same time, there are so many things which are sort of just sitting there, blocking the passage of other objects. For example, on DNA, you can have these nucleosomes, so there are histone proteins sitting there. Then there are DNA helicases which are moving. There are other processes uh, that I'll not get into, which are done by this rat, rat 51. And so it is a heavily crowded situation, large number of objects are moving, replication and even transcription can go simultaneously. So there are these various traffic-like phenomena that we study by mathematical models. Now you may think that jam or traffic congestion is always bad, that is not necessarily so, at least in this molecular domain. So this is one example of such beneficial effects of traffic congestion. What is shown here is a nucleosome around which the DNA is wrapped. And so this is the leading RNA polymerase, which is transcribing this DNA. So it is moving on this track. And then what can happen that this is such a blockage that alone this RNA polymerase is unable to proceed forward. So it gets not only stalled, it can also even backtrack at this point. So alone it is unable to proceed for further. And then comes another trailing RNA polymerase from behind. And they, then this one gives it a push. And that push is enough for it to dislodge the blocking protein or histone proteins here. And then they together can resume transcription once again. So this kind of 
you know, interaction between the different RNA polymerases is need not always be detrimental, but it can be beneficial also like this example shows. And this is taken from a real experiment, which I'll not get into the details. And this is an experimental observation. First, let me begin with translation. And what happens in translation is that you have a machine which is pretty large. How large? Well, it can cover simultaneously about 30 nucleotides on the mRNA transcript. And so these are the just cartons that they are moving on the same single RNA track. How do we model this? Well, this was done many, many years ago. This whole thing began in 1968 in this classic paper. So although there are many mathematicians work on this problem, but this problem was initiated by biologists and published in this journal, Biopolymers. And so how did they model this phenomenon? They modeled this each of these ribosomes as a hard rod. Why hard rod? Because that just simplifies the problem. Why rod? That is simply because each of these ribosomes is covering 30 nucleotides. So if you take three nucleotides, that's a codon. So about 10 codons are being covered by it. So they say that, you know, if you say that each of these cells that are shown here by the squares, okay, each of these are representing a codon, then simultaneously each of these rods is covering about 10 codons, so that's like a rod rather than a particle. So that's the motivation instead of taking particle, why do you take a rod? And why hard uh, rods? That's just a you know, simplification. And how and do you capture that they are hard rods? I'll come to that in a few minutes. So this is a problem which later got the name, totally asymmetric simple exclusion process. Okay, so let me explain what is that. First of all, each of these objects, the rods, they hop forward. In principle, they can hop forward as well as backward. But if you want an average, on the average they move forward, then obviously forward hopping rate has to be larger than the backward hopping rate. So they have to be asymmetric. So this is asymmetric, that is the A. Then simple exclusion process, this is, if you recall, Pauli exclusion process. So it is similar, but there's no quantum mechanics here. So what it means that none of these sites can be occupied by more than one rod at a time. So they exclude each other. And what is T? T for totally asymmetric. So if you simplify this model saying that each of the rods can move only forward, then it is totally asymmetric, simple exclusion process. So this is the TASEP that I will use throughout this talk. So TASEP means totally asymmetric, simple exclusion process. What do they do in each step? Okay, before going to this, let me explain what is the algorithm or what is the you know the rule for the forward movement. At every time step, each of these rods gets an opportunity to move forward at some rate, but they can do so if and only if the target site is empty. So notice that although length is L, here L is three, they move actually in step size of one. That is simply because the each codon has to be translated. So that's why step size is one, although the rod length is larger than one. So this is a rod, but it moves just in steps of one. And exclusion basically means that whenever you know, they're trying to move forward, they can do so provided that site is not already covered by another ribosome in this particular case. Now this appears to be quite straightforward. However, the ribosome is much more complicated. So one way of looking at it is the following, that each ribosome actually is a big object, so it's not a rod, and a lot of other things happen. And what happens that, as you heard yesterday in uh, Professor Puglesi's lecture, that uh, there are these so-called tRNAs, these tRNAs enter into the inter-subunit space, so as if there is an entry and exit door there. And at a time, not more than three passengers are allowed. So they enter through this entry point, they carry the amino acid, and after supplying this amino acids, they have to make an exit. So what you have is polysome can be looked at as if it's a ribosome traffic, where each of these ribosomes is like a bus, and there are these passengers who come in and make an exit, and every individual here has a very important role. So it is much more complicated than the simple model with which the initially people started modeling. Okay. So again, you know, these were the two classic papers uh, which initiated this whole uh, modeling strategy. Then, of course, it was taken over also by mathematicians. There are these books written on 
totally, I mean, various aspects of totally asymmetric simple exclusion process. So if all these things have already been done, that the model has been developed and even rigorous theorems have been proved, what are we doing there? Well, it turns out that there are a lot of things that can be done in the last 10 years. In a, a lot of work have been done and these are sort of the reviews uh, written on this. So let me try to tell you some of the things included there and some of the things that we have done very recently. So let me begin the modeling strategy. So what we are doing, we're looking not just at a rod, we're looking at much more details of that. So the discrete mechanochemical states of the machine, each of these machines, say ribosome, they form the vertices of a network or a graph, while the directed edges of this graph denote the allowed transitions. So that is how we model this. This is not a continuum model, it's a model where the states are being described with discrete states. And the operation of the machine, that means its stochastic kinetics, is modeled as a Markov process in a heat bath at constant temperature, and it is formulated in terms of master equations. Okay, so let me again remind you what uh, Professor Puglisi had said yesterday in his talk about the cycle of one single individual ribosome. So let us begin at the beginning of a cycle. These are cyclic machines. So I'm starting at the beginning of the cycle. So you have this P site where you have a tRNA which actually has the growing polypeptide or the protein attached to it. And then comes, you know, so it's omega A that is telling you the rate at which the amino acids are coming. They don't come alone, they are carried by the tRNAs. So this is the arrival rate. So a new amino acid has come, but this is attached not only to an amino acid, which is shown by this red dot here, but it is also bound to this elongation factor Tu and a molecule of GTP. And then this GTP is, so first thing is that there is codon anti-codon matching. That is essential to first stage of checking whether this is the correct or cognate tRNA. Then comes the second stage. So there, so this is the first level of checking whether it's correct or incorrect. If it is incorrect, it is thrown out. So this is the reverse process. However, if it passes through that, there is no guarantee that it is still correct because it could be very nearly correct, but not exactly correct. These are called near cognate tRNA. So this GTP is hydrolyzed by this elongation factor because it is a GTPase, so it becomes diphosphate. And so this is one more round of checking, which is called kinetic proofreading. If it is near cognate, but not cognate, normally it will be thrown out again. And this has to start all over again. However, if it is correct, then this is incorporated. What it's meant by that is this new amino acid that has been brought in, that is attached to the growing polypeptide. So it is in fact from the bottom here. So this amino acid is incorporated this whole thing is transferred here. And after that, there is this rotational Brownian motion that goes back and forth between the, these two states, which is something, again, yesterday was summarized by Professor Puglesi. So this is the rotational uh, Brownian motion between the two subunits. So you know, it ha the ribosome has this large subunit and small subunit. Interesting point is that the decoding of the genetic message goes on in the smaller subunit. Accordingly, the tRNAs are selected and amino acids are selected. However, the actual incorporation and elongation of the amino acid takes place in the larger subunit. So after this you know, back and forth movement, then at some point GTP is hydrolyzed, which accelerates the forward motion. So forward motion is translocation, whereby these two amino acids, they go to the next one, that means E site, then eventually it leaves this E site, this one, which one here, P site, then again, you know, goes to its original A site, cycle is completed, and this goes on. So this is sort of the cyclic machine. But important thing is that it is not a very, you know, a straightforward cyclic machine because there is this branched pathway. And I'm coming to that in a few minutes. It has important consequences. Okay, so to summarize, how do we, so for the students only, experts can sort of take a nap now. So we write master equation, and master equation is nothing but simply just you know, accounting for gain and loss. So what you do is you define Pn, probability of finding the particle. The particle could be a ribosome or RNA polymers or whatever you have decided to call a particle. In the discrete state n at time t, so you write dp and dt, you have all the processes which will bring the system from any other state into n, 
and these are the loss terms which will take the system out of n to any other system. So this is like you know the jumping of this frog on this lily pond. So this is what we are capturing through the master equation. So that's our strategy. Now let me remind you that we are talking about a cyclic machine, and for students, the you know the first thing you learn about you know, cyclic machines is this engine that Sadi Karnar had imagined. So you have this neat cycle and it goes through this repeatedly. Now, it, this is interesting, but sort of useless from practical terms because it has some efficiency that we learn in school, but we usually are not told this its power output is zero. Its power output is zero because it does some amount of work, but it's done so slowly that the total time taken for the cycle is infinite, so power output is zero. All our molecular machines, on the other hand, have finite power output. Now, let me remind you what are the interesting additional complexities here. It is again the same cycle that I have shown you a few minutes ago. But because of this kinetic proofreading step, this is a loose coupling machine. What is meant by loose coupling? That means it is not guaranteed that if fuel is burnt, there will be movement. Here, one molecule of GTP has been hydrolyzed, but it doesn't lead to any movement. It starts back again from you know, state number one. So because of this, fuel consumption doesn't necessarily give rise to the movement. These are loose coupling machines. That is one interesting feature which is different from our macroscopic engines. Sometimes also you have to be careful because you know number of states that we imagine or we sort of try to extract from, sorry, from the experiments, we have to be careful. So this is number of states that I have shown you. It turns out that there are some other hidden states which are not necessarily picked up by experiments. And you know, about two years ago, we uh, had shown that in between two states, there are two additional states here, which one has to be careful to pick up. For example, cryo-EM picks up those two short-lived states, whereas single molecule fret misses those because these are faster and they cannot pick up this short-lived states. So how many states should I have in a model? It depends on the time scales. And so today, given the time scale, given the observations, it may be five state model is good enough. Tomorrow, with more refinement, and I may have to augment this by adding more states to the model. That is the moral of the story. So let me now show you how we model these. First thing is that in this uh, simplified version, the oversimplified version of ribosome traffic on uh, messenger RNA. Uh, you have here the particles, as I told you, entering from this end, going out of this end. Now, if I now try to plot a phase diagram, so what are the possible phases that I can have? If the entry rate, so this is the entry rate, if the entry rate is quite high and exit rate is small, of course, initially they will be transient. After a while, this is going to be heavily crowded by the motors, and I'll have high density of motors here. So this is the high density phase, which appears obvious. Now, physicists call it a high density phase. In biology, we'll call it that it is a protein synthesis where the rate limiting is not the initiation, but the termination. So, that is sort of the distinction in the terminology, but the phenomenon is the same. Similarly, if you consider the entry rate to be uh, small, exit rate to be high, then you have only f in a few um, uh, such ribosomes on the track, so it's sparsely populated, you have low density phase, and you can have a medium density phase which is called maximal current phase. And what is that? What is that can be understood from this figure here, that I have here in a translation initiation rate, which is the entry rate of the motors in the physicist language. And this is the translation termination rate, which is the exit rate of the motors. And as I said here, you have high density and low density phases. The maximal current phase that you see here is that sort of an optimal one where you have quite large number of them but not so large that they will hinder each other's motion, reducing the current. So this gives you the maximal current that you could imagine in the bulk. So these are the sort of the phase diagram that were known earlier when you imagine only rods are moving in a touch step. Now let me take you to the more, more recent ones. So first I'll tell you that you know, when we started this work, we tried to incorporate 
the effects of the mechanochemical cycles of individual ribosomes on the polysomes. So individual cycles that I have shown you, it could be five state or seven state model. So, okay, so in that, okay, so what happens then that you don't have this just two dimensional phase diagram, you have other control parameters. So this could be rate of hydrolysis of the you know, GTP, or it could be uh, some other which I'll not get into. So depending on the other control parameter that you have, you have higher dimensional phase diagrams. You can take the cross sections and you can see how they compare with the two dimensional phase diagram that originally were sort of derived. So this is pretty old, but I just wanted to motivate that how we sort of in started incorporating the complexities of the problem as we proceeded. Okay, so more recent works. So regulation of ribosome traffic on messenger RNA template and control of unconventional translation. That's what I'm going to talk next. And unconventional translation, there are several modes of unconventional translation because whatever I have told you so far are the modes of conventional translation. Now, translation happens to be an interesting thing because you know, for that you have a mRNA transcript. So in transcription, of course, you have the DNA on which the RNA polymerases move. Whereas in the case of translation, the template is RNA and messenger RNA actually can regulate gene by its structure. And there are several complex structural elements that are involved. First thing is that it can have these kinds of pseudo knots. And as I'm going to show you, these pseudo knots can give rise to some unconventional phenomena which are not seen in the conventional translation. So this has an important role to play. In fact, and I like this statement here, it says unlike DNA, which universally adopts a double helical conformation, RNA has extensive intramolecular interactions that cause it to fold into an array of complex structures. RNA structure is highly dynamic and is governed by factors such as temperature, cellular energy states, etc., etc. So RNA structures enable a myriad of functions which include encoding genetic information. So it is not just ordinary track, we'll see that even in the sequence, there are signals encoded which can give rise to interesting phenomena. So this is sort of the thing that I'm going to consider. We explored the regulatory roles of secondary structures of mRNA on ribosome traffic. So first of all, you know, we sometimes think that errors are not good for the cell, but errors also give rise to evolution, molecular evolution. So errors are required, but too much error may be a problem. So random error is something that has been studied for you know, many years, but I'm not going to talk about random errors. I'm going to talk about programmed errors. So for that, let me explain first con conventional translation. In conventional translation, you have this five prime to three prime end of the transcript where you have this A, U, G, etc., the sequences, and you take triplets. So first three, so that is one single codon that codes for a particular amino acid. Then the next three is another codon codes for another amino acid and so on. So from this RNA sequence where you have the four letter alphabet, A, U, C, G, you translate it into this 20 letter alphabet for the proteins. And usually there are very special ones which are which signal initiation, and there are special ones which are stop codons which signal the process has to be stopped there. So that is normal translation. Now, something very interesting can happen. And what can happen is, let us look at this. So you have this nucleic acid where you have, a, as I said, triplets, one, two, three, four triplets. So first, this will encode for a particular amino acid. This will encode for another one. Three will encode for another one. And suppose the process begins from this side. So process begins, and so three at a time, three of these are dictating what will be the amino acid that is being taken. Then suddenly at some point for a priority in the beginning, let's assume that we don't know why, suddenly this reading frame, reading frame is reading three at a time, this reading frame shifts backward by one. So this is the frame shift that suddenly it has shifted by one and then it starts again. But now that it starts, see, now it starts taking this one as the first. So instead of reading these three and these three, now it starts from here. So these are the three, then these are the three. It starts reading with this reading frame, but the triplets have all got altered. 
So from now onwards, the sequence that it is going to read is completely different one. So that means it should have synthesized a given protein up to coming this point, but now it is synthesizing a fusion protein. That means it is a combination of this first part of the original protein, and the second part is a totally different one. So when it comes out, it is a fusion protein. Initially, when this was discovered, people, I know, there was a debate, people thought that two separate proteins are being made and they are sort of fused together at some stage. It was proved later that no, it is just in one pro single process, this fusion protein is coming out. Now this, of course, is very important because, as was pointed out yesterday also, that in HIV, there are these GAG genes and pole genes which are encoded in this particular fashion. And so the protein that comes out is a fusion protein. GAG gives rise to a structural protein, whereas Paul gives you a polymerizing protein. So these two are made from the same mRNA strand. So this is, you know, it appears that this is an error, but this is not an error. This is a deliberate error. This is a site which is encoded there and it has special features where this is going to happen. So this is a programmed error, and this programmed error can give rise to recoding, and so this is a very interesting hot area of research now in translation. So what is the advantage why uh, this happens? Probably the viruses use this one single strand to encode multiple proteins there, so it can, in principle, encode three times as many, because just by frame shift, there is a new sequence that is available. So this is what I mentioned. So what we did, so let me summarize what we did. So first of all, what is known from experiments is that you have, for this program frame shift, you have two ingredients which are very crucial. There is a particular sequence, XXXYYZ, which is a slippery sequence. I'll not get into actually what they are. What is special here is that the, essentially the grip of the ribosome on that track is somewhat loose. And there is a pseudonaut in front of it, which is not easy for it. Remember, a ribosome has its helicase activity, so it has to unwrap and go forward. But because it is not so easy to open it, it stalls or waits longer period at this point, And it is prone to slippage, and that's why frame shift takes place. So what we do is that we don't actually look at the cause of this. So because you know, there are many people involved in finding out the cause, and there are five different models of cause. We're not getting into that debate. We are looking at the consequence of that. So we model this strand as consisting of three segments. So this part of this segment, that, that segment one, which is sort of pretty normal, except that there is a possibility of a frame shift here. Then the second part, which is a pseudonaut, you just imagine that you have opened it up. So that is the segment, that is the part of the pseudonaut. And the, again, this third part is this part, which is again pretty normal. What is the difference? Difference is that if the translation can go on at the first segment and second seg third segment at some rate, in the second segment, it can go at a much slower rate. And at a very special site here, the frame shift is possible. And what is the result that we get? We have actually you know, done the theoretical calculations. It's a mean field theory. And we have also done simulation. So the continuous curve is showing you the theoretical result and the dots are showing you the simulation. Pretty good agreement given that it's only mean field approximation. But the important thing is that this is non-monotonic. So what is plotted against what? So this is the, you know, basically how often frame shift will take place, and that is plotted here against the stiffness of this pseudonaut. Now, if the pseudonaut is very soft, so then what is going to happen? The ribosome can, without much difficulty, open this pseudonaut and move forward. That means it is not going to wait very long at this site, slippery site. So the likelihood of frame shift is going to be low. So that is exactly what you are seeing here. On the other hand, sorry, here. On the other hand, if omega s is very small, that means the pseudonaut is very stiff, then what is going to happen is that each ribosome has to wait here for a long period of time because it's not so easy to pass through the pseudonaut. But in the meantime, from behind, large number of other my, the, uh, ribosomes will come and queue up. So at that point, although it is prone to frame shift, but there is no way it can do that because from behind, there's only the other one which is just touching it and waiting there. 
So it is because of that, that again the likelihood goes down, so it will give rise to this non-monotonic behavior. So what is the message that uh, this uh, theory gives us? It says that earlier people believed, or at least till now, experimentally believed, that there are two essential ingredients that determine the frame-shift frequency, namely slippery sequence and the pseudonaut, their locations are important. What we are saying that on top of that, there is another dyna dynamic control parameter, and that is the density of the ribosomes, and that is dynamic because that can be controlled by the entry, exit, and other parameters. So depending on how crowded the track is in this region, the frequency of frame shift can be decreased. Well, do such things happen elsewhere? No experiment has been done, but uh, Stephen Klump and Mamta Sahu, who are in the audience, they had looked at a similar phenomena, which is not translation, it is transcription. And there, it's interesting to read this, a trailing RNA polymerase, it is not a ribosome because it is transcription, a trailing RNA polymerase on the same template can interfere with backtracking as it progressively restricts the space that is available for backward translocation, which is analogous to our frame shift and thereby ratchets the backward RNAP forward, et cetera, et cetera. So this phenomena that was observed in the context of RNA polymerase traffic, something similar that we are seeing in the ribosome traffic in the context of translation. Now that was one kind of unconventional translation. Another unconventional translation is what is called, so it's non-canonical or unconventional, it's called IRES, internal ribosome entry site. What happens there? Again, pseudonaut of the RNA is a very key ingredient. So imagine that you have a RNA pseudonaut somewhere here. Canonical translation will begin from this point and proceed in this direction. Of course, in between you have this pseudonaut. But just downstream from the pseudonaut, there are special sites where ribosome can come straight and start translation. So because it is internal entry, this is called internal ribosome entry region. So what you have here, the two possible modes of translation. From this end, conventional translation can begin, like the one that I have described earlier. This is unconventional because in the technical terms, so it is not starting from the cap region, it is not starting by scanning, it is just straightway the ribosome lands as if on this particular point. Well, not exactly so. The largest small subunit have to come and attach together here, but nevertheless, this is an internal entry without scanning from where translation can begin. Are these two going to interfere against with each other in any way? So this is a problem that we studied again with the TASEP-based mathematical models. So again, we have three segments, like the previous problem. The segment two is representing the pseudonaut, and as before, in this region, the ribosomes are going to move slower because they have to unzip or unwind the RNA to move forward. And we have two regions, the first region when they have normal way of movement and the third one here, they move normally. It is this third region where in principle two groups of ribosomes can interfere. One group of ribosomes which start from here, they are synthesizing a particular protein, identical copies, so different copies of the identical protein, okay. So, and here they are making protein again, but they are making a different protein because their starting point is here. So these two groups of ribosome, can they interfere? And if they interfere, what is the consequence of that? So what would do that? Uh, okay, so here, if you imagine that you have basically three different TASEPs, there's an effective exit rate, effective entry rate, effective exit, effective entry. Then these effective rates can be sort of calculated. So that is what uh, Babi Amishra sitting in the audience, she did. And let me summarize the results in graphically. So these are 3D plots. Maybe it's not very clearly visible. So let me come to this 2D plot here. So here the flux or the current of the ribosomes are being plotted as a function of the initiation rate of the conventional translation, which begins from the capped N. As the current, so these are J1 and J2, these are the currents or flux of the two different groups of ribosomes. As the current of one increases, that of the other decreases, suppressing the one. So that means they are interfering, 
So increasing current of the conventional one is decreasing the current of the unconventional one. Now, is it possible that such things happen? Well, what is known is that in, the, in bacteria, at least, it's known that there are some thing called RNA thermometers. So you have these pseudonaut kind of things, okay, secondary structures, and secondary structure can open or close with slight change of temperature. So what we believe that in principle, it is possible that one of these, which is not accessible normally, becomes accessible under some stress, could be temperature. And then this kind of interference in principle should be observable, but this is just a theoretical prediction at this moment. But again, such phenomena are known in transcription. So I'm coming to a very similar phenomena in transcription where, so it's a special temporal organization of the RNAP motors on DNA track that I'm going to look at. So from translation, again, I'm going to now transcription and we're going to look at the effect of, uh, first, the effect of uh, Mecha the mechanochemical cycles. So this is, uh, let me skip all this, maybe that is not needed. Okay, let me come to this first. Okay, so what happens in uh, transcription that on the DNA, you have all kinds of promoters, you have shared bidirectional promoters from the, trans where, from where the transcription can begin. You have what is called cryptic promoter. So there are what are called antisense transcripts. So what are the antisense transcripts? Antisense transcripts are transcribed from strand opposite to that of the sense transcript. So you have two strands of the DNA and you can have sense and antisense transcripts made from these two strands opposite to each other. So like transcription factors, these are, can, okay, these are also regulators of gene expression. And this can establish, as I'm going to also show you, establish on-off bistable switches. So this is the game played because you have on the same strand of, same stretch of DNA, more than one gene encoded either on the same strand or the two strands of the duplex. First of all, let us look at how you know, the genes are sort of overlapping or nested. So on a single strand of DNA, you can have one gene encoded like this, five prime to three prime end, and you have another one which is encoded again in one segment of that. So these are parallel overlap of the two genes. Of course, you can also have anti-parallel overlaps. So you can have what is called convergent overlaps. That means one one strand, of course, it goes from five prime to three prime like this. The other goes five prime to three prime like this, but there is one part where these two sort of are overlapping each other. So there are interesting things that can happen because of such things. So this is convergent overlap. You can have divergent overlap. That means basically there is a small segment where there is overlap. This one continues in this direction, whereas the other one continues in the other direction. So overlap is restricted only in this region. Sometimes there is also full overlap. This is one gene, this is the other one, and this is entirely embedded inside the other one, which is longer one. So in all such situations, there are different modes of what is called transcriptional interference, but we are interested only one particular mode of transcriptional interference, namely that that arises from the bodily collision or interaction between the RNA polymerases. So several different names were given. For example, this is promoter competition. So this one has to come here but then this place is already occupied by the other one. So they are transcribing two different genes. And so there is a competition for the promoter between these two groups. That's one possibility. Then there is what is called sitting duck interference. So one of them is sitting there, but is not moving. The other one comes and can hit it and dislodge it. Similarly, there is occlusion. So if this is occupying, so this blue actually showing one group of RNA polymerases. So if this site is occupied by the blue, this one is unable to come and cannot bind and so on. So there can be collision of between them. There can be roadblocks. So these are the different names that were given by uh, experimental biologists. Some of them actually are not distinct phenomena. They are basically the same thing, slightly different and different names were given. So what we did is that we developed a model for this. So let me first describe you know, what this model. So you have again this one dimensional chain, which is basically describing one uh, DNA strand, DNA template strand. And 
uh, from one and two, these two arrows, you know, uh, red and green, uh, from there, the two gene expression can begin. Now, if, you know, this gene one is being expressed very heavily, so what is going to happen that this position is going to be occupied most often by the RNA polymerases, which are transcribing gene one. So as a result, this site is occluded and so the other RNA polymerases are unable to get access to it. And so you expect that the expression of gene number two will be suppressed. So that's one possible scenario. Other possible scenario is that they have all, they have begun from one and two, but then one is you know, effectively working as a roadblock for the other one. This is what happens in collinear movement when the two genes are encoded on the same strand. Now, if the two genes, sense and antisense, are encoded on the two you know, strands facing each other, so these red ones, they have started from one, from here, and going from left to right, whereas gene number two is being you know, transcribed now from right to left, and so on the way, there will be head-on collision between them. Question is, what can happen? What can happen? One possible scenario is that at least one of them, maybe both of them, this is probabilistic, will get dislodged from the track, and that will be premature termination of that particular transcription. Other alternative possibility that one can pass the other. So by this process, they actually can slow down, but they can again resume their trans transcription after passing each other. So this is describing all this uh, you know, in terms of the rates of the various processes. And what are the results? So we write down the master equation, as I told you. and. Uh, Okay, under mean field approximation, then we solve those. So the continuous curves shown here are from the mean field theory. The discrete data points are from simulation. And so the flux or overall rate of transcription is plotted against this alpha one is the rate of initiation of gene number one. When the gene number one uh, is not being transcribed heavily, so the corresponding flux is low. So at that point, the gene number two can, so gene number two is this one, so that can have high level of expression, but as the rate of transcription of gene number one increases, larger number of RNA polymerases are passing through, then corresponding flux increases, and as it increases, it starts already suppressing the expression of gene number two. So at some point, it is so heavily going on that most of the time, this site is occupied by this RNAPs which are transcribing gene number one. So this site is no longer available to them, so it is occlusion, and this is the dominant effect because of which this is suppressed almost to the vanishingly low level. So this is the phenomenon that I was talking about, that this pair can form a bistable switch. It can be either in the on state, on basically would mean that the first gene is expressed and the second is repressed, or in the off state where just the opposite happens, the first in repressed and second is expressed. It is no external control, it is that these two together, of course there has to be some signal which is going to you know, sort of vary this rate, but overall they mutually they form just a simplest you know, circuit of constituent only two of them and can give rise to this switch-like behavior. And the such things were sort of so, you know, speculated earlier in the literature, but we show clearly that such things are possible. Then what happens in contradirectional situation? That means now the uh, two genes are encoded on the two strands facing each other. And so as I told you that head-on collision now is possible. Now in head-on collision, are they going to dislodge each other or can they pass? So this experiment was done for phage, that means bacteriophage RNA polymerases. And the net result that they showed is that in head-on collision, two RNA polymerases approaching one another on the same DNA may pass one another. And for the experts that I'll just spend two minutes on this. So what they did is that to allow two polymerases to move toward one another in a controlled manner, a template was constructed that contains a promoter for T7 RNA polymerase. So this is T7. And a promoter for T3 RNA polymerase arranged in the opposite direction. So this is the T3. And then, so this is what happens, T7 elongation complex, and this is the T3 elongation complex. And what they find, that they can sort of pass each other and resume transcription. 
So we can capture this in our model. And if we do that, then again, we find switch-like behavior, high transcription rate of one, low of the other. And then after this is increasing, this dominates, the other is practically switched off. So here this is happening because essentially, you know, when they are slowing down, it is the collision which is dominating this effect. So that is good enough for giving the switch-like behavior. Other possible scenario that when such you know, two polymerases come head-on and have head-on collision, one can dislodge the other. It turns out that that is a very interesting, uh, you know, it has interesting effect. A part of the HIV latency is related to that. In fact, when HIV is incorporated into the host genome, so sometimes they are, you know, I, I don't know the reason, uh, quite often they are incorporated in regions which are highly transcribed. So if they are actually, you know, there is co-directional uh, transcription that is required, then what happens that they, they can be dislodged. And similarly, you know, if they are going to be transcribed and there is a head-on collision, again, the corresponding, so it's not a very strong one, so they are dislodged. And this dislodging of the RNA polymerases actually prevent their uh, expression to a dominant level and so the HIV remains in the latent stage for a long period of time. So that is what is sort of believed and further details can be seen looked into in this article. So we again captured this in our model. So instead of now passing each other, then one gets dislodged. Of course, this is probabilistic. Which one gets dislodged is probabilistic. And nevertheless, here again, switch-like behavior is observed. But the mechanism here is totally different. It is simply because of this dislodging from the track, premature termination of transcription of at least one of them, which is responsible for the switch-like behavior. So far, I have restricted my attention only to uh, collision of RNA polymerase, RNA polymerase, or the ribosomes. The last part, I'm going to focus on collision of RNAP motors and replisomes on a DNA track during simultaneous transcription and replication. And this kind of situation gave rise to a conflict, which is absolutely essential for the cell to try to resolve this conflict. Otherwise, it will have detrimental effect of the replication, which can be fatal for the cell. So what is known is that simultaneously, of course, in various regions, transcription and replication can go on. But then the replication requires that a fork, the so-called replication fork, that propagates and when that propagates in a segment of the DNA, that segment of the DNA at that point of time may be transcribed by RNA polymerases. So the best way to understand the you know, scenarios is this one. So first of all, when DNA gets replicated, so there is this leading strand that is replicated in a continuous manner, but the lagging strand is replicated in bits and pieces, which are called Okazaki fragments. And you have this fork, which is propagating in this direction. So this is the replication fork. And when it is moving in this direction, there is this RNA polymerase, which is transcribing this DNA here. But remember, there are two strands, and only one of these is serving as the template. So in this figure, it is the lower one, which is serving as the template. So the RNA polymerase is moving in this direction, and so does the uh, replication fork. But replication fork usually have a higher speed, so soon it will catch up, and they will have co-directional collision. Just the opposite will happen if the replication fork propagates in the same direction, but now the RNA polymerase is transcribing this other strand, because in this case, it has to move from right to left, because they have a directionality. So, in this case, the replication fork and the RNA polymerase will have head-on collision. Question is, what are the consequences? Or rather, what are the plausible ways in which such conflicts are resolved by the cell? So conflict resolution, okay? So what we do is that uh, we have again a model where we have two species of particles. One of the species is representing this rounded ones. These are representing the RNA polymerases. Now, of course, you can have a whole crowd of RNA polymerases because a particular segment can be transcribed many times. However, remember, the replication happens only once in the lifetime of the cell. So the second seg uh, 
and a species of particles, which are shown by green, there are only two of those which are moving. So they are representing essentially the two replication forks which are coming from the two sides. So all the and the rounded ones which are representing RNA polymerases or the transcription elongation complex, they all move from left to right in our convention. However, the replication forks, the, these two move from the opposite direction because when is the replication completed? When these two find next to each other, they have covered this entire stretch, that means this part of the DNA has been replicated, replication is completed. However, there are difficulties on the way because they may encounter the RNA polymerases. Question is, what is going to happen then? So normally, if everything was going fine and only replication was taking place, then you know, they would move and meet at some point in the middle, replication completed. If replication was not going on, but only transcription was going on, so then these RNA polymerases will attach at the starting point. They would move forward after reaching this termination and so they will get detached. However, because of this conflict now, there are several possibilities. So we captured these possibilities that are known in literature. So one possibility, okay, sorry for the resolution of this figure. So one possibility is that they can pass each other. Second possibility is the RNA polymerase is dislodged from the track and the, DNA, uh, the, the replication fork proceeds as if nothing has happened. Third possibility is that the replication fork stalled for quite some time and then this is the collapse of the replication fork. So all three possibilities have been captured and I'll show you some results. So this is a new unpublished result. <coughs> we have a heuristic uh, mean field argument through which we find what is the replication time in the presence of interactions. And so this continuous curves that you are seeing are from obtained from this uh, theoretical prediction and these discrete data points are obtained from our simulation. The reason that there is an increase here with the increase of the transcription rate is that this is what is called the low density region and once for this you, we reach the maximal current phase there is a saturation of the replication time. It can not increase anymore. Uh, so there are three kinds of uh, uh, phenomena happen replication. Replication can uh, complete normally. So this is a successful replication of type 1. Successful replication of type 2 happens when one of the replication forks stalls, but other one can still proceed and eventually complete the trans, trans, uh, replication. And this is you know, where unsuccessful replication, that means replication is aborted, which can be fatal for the cell. And we have uh, found the statistics of these events. So that essentially tells us what is the effect of transcription on replication. I think I have almost completed. Now in the case, context of ribosome, we did not you know, have anywhere uh, so far the ribosome getting dislodged. But recently one group has developed a model for ribosome drop-off. So that will open up other possibilities in the phase diagram. Uh, one of my students, Shamsri, is going to talk about uh, cytoskeletal motor traffic, particularly uh, you know, intraflagellar transport, on which we have worked very recently. So I'll not talk about this at all. Let me thank all my collaborators. So over the last 10-year period, I have had several bright students, PhD and undergraduate students working with me. And then I have uh, collaborated with uh, many people from other places and the ones shown in red are the ones whose work were mentioned in this talk today and I have been generously supported by various agencies including my own institution. Thank you for your attention. So in uh, case of transcriptional interference, so if suppose two genes, they overlap each other and both are in the same direction. So if the overlap, you showed one situation where the one of the gene, one of the polymerase, if in that the promoter side, it can act as a roadblock for the other one. Repeat that again, sorry. Uh, so if, uh, are, okay, one of the uh, polymerase in uh, uh, corresponding gene, if it at the promoter side, then it can be as a roadblock for the other, other one. So is it possible if it is in the, um, if they meet each other in the overlapping region and they are in the same direction, so can one uh, act as a roadblock for the other one? Sure. So that is essentially the exclusion. 
So, okay. But it depends on uh, when you say roadblock, if you have in mind the static roadblock, mm -hmm. okay, that depends again on the rate. So if it is very slowly transcribing, so it may spend long time there. And for that deviation, it is like almost like a static roadblock. Okay. But none of them are static, okay, strictly speaking. So they are moving forward, transcribing their respective genes. And so the one which is in front is acting as an effective roadblock for some duration for the one which is following it. Okay. And one more question. Actually, uh, when these two polymerase, um, they meet each other, like in the case of collision situation, so how it is decided which one will be dislodged? Okay. So as far as the experiment is concerned, experiment doesn't give us any sort of you know, information about it. So what is observed that they are dislodged. Now, again, nobody has done the calculation of the, you know, what is the you know, binding strength, how strongly one is bound to the track. If that is known, one can say that one that is sort of weakly bound is more likely to get dislodged. So since that information is not available, what we do is that we allow the probabilistic detachment of both. It's just a matter of probability which one gets dislodged. Okay. Yeah. So in order to compare the results, you uh, need the rates from the experiment and then you incorporate, compare them with the simulations. Yeah. But how do you get these rates from the item? So there are many situations where you know, rates are not available. So if rate is not available, so we sort of vary over a range to you know, typical values to see the phenomena that we are interested in, whether this is robust enough with that variation. And some of the rates are available from you know, measurements, so we take those. So it's not always that all the rates are available. Hello. In that, uh, this uh, replication and uh, transcription, so what are the time scales? For example, I was naively thinking mm. uh, if rep transcription happens very fast, the mm. uh, four could wait there until the transcription is over. See, and transcription, remember, is not just a, you know one RNA polymer is finished and that's it. Transcription is going on because one has started doing, the other one is following it. So, you know, it's, there's a continuous, un unless, of course, you know, something drastic happens, the whole thing collapses. So there is this ongoing process. So it, okay, so you're right. I mean, it can wait for some time. So it's a matter of probability that if there is nothing coming in front, it can provoke it further. So... It's not a human being, right? I mean, that's why I wait <laughs> till these things pass, I will again start my journey. Oh, so my question is about the ribosome Sorry? graphic yeah. model. Ah. So you have considered the uh, initiation and termination rates and also like the secondary structures of the MRA, so some topology of the track. But uh, uh, some tRNAs are abandoned than the other. Some tRNAs are abandoned than the others, like in the cell. So wouldn't that also contribute, like, to the ribosome traffic? Like, sure. So in, in fact, it, there's something more to it. Okay. First of all, even in a given situation, that available concentration of the tRNAs will basically, you know, determine the rate of arrival. So that controls the rate of translation through just trivial arrival rate. But on top of that, what is known as codon usage bias. Okay. The codon usage bias is that nature well, is adopted that those which are synonymous, okay, some are used in one context and you know, not in another one. So all this can be captured essentially by the rate constant because after all the very first one is the arrival rate, which is a product of the actual you know, the, the, the rate multiplied concentration. So it's a second order in that sense if you look at the chemical rate equation. So the concentration is captured there. So obviously, it is built into the models. So this, this concerns your programmed frame shifting example, where you have this nice maximum in the flux that goes into the frame shifting pathway. And, and as I see it, this is basically the consequence of two different kinetic competitions. You have competition between going forward through the pause signal against going backward into the frame shift, while you also have a competition between going backward and the going backward becoming blocked by the next arriving ribosome. So I think if, if you looked at those rates, you could get some interesting constraints on how such a system can be designed. 
So my question is, have you looked at the actual rates, for example, how, how large the initiation rate can be for this to work or something like this? Yeah. So, you know, these are all within the rates, realistic range. So, you know, none of these are outside realistic range. That is something that we have checked. And you were right that it's basically competition between the arrival rate of the ribosomes at that point and the rate at which the frame shift is likely to happen. So if they arrive at a, in a faster rate than the frame shift, then obviously they are going to block it. So it's a kinetic competition between the rate at which they are likely to frame shift and the rate at which the ribosomes are arriving. The numbers that uh, Vabya used, she can give you more details. These are all in the realistic range of translation. So in principle should be observable, but as I was talking to uh, you know, Puglisi, and I have also talked to some other people who do these experiments, uh, Farabo and uh, Atkins and others. So you know, normally the polysome thing has not been done in the context of frame shift. So not only the frame shift measurement have to be done, but it has to be done in the context of uh, the polysome. So if that is done in principle, that can be sort of detected.